to welcome our first keynote speaker of the day, slightly later than planned, but uh, every cloud has a silver lining and he's had the opportunity now to listen to the uh, panelists on the first panel and uh, uh, to jot down some notes. I'm sure he'll be eager to respond to them. Uh, our first keynote speaker has been the Palestinian representative to the UK since 2005, prior to which he led an illustrious career in academia uh, and uh, in diplomacy and political consultancy. He worked, I hope you don't mind me saying, for almost a quarter uh, or over a quarter of a century for Bethlehem University, uh, at, uh, at which he reached the, the post of uh, executive vice president, uh, a post that he held for almost a decade. Uh, he has consulted uh, with a variety of Palestinian uh, organizations and government departments, uh, and he is a prolific author writing about the Palestinian uh, cause, including civil society, uh, the rights of refugees, uh, and peace building with uh, Israel. Join me, please, in welcoming uh, our first keynote speaker, His Excellency, uh, Ambassador Manuel Hassassian. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. I'm delighted to be with you here this morning. I always give the best speeches when I'm in universities because uh, this is my longing to academia. I have been in academia for the last 30 years and still, you know, I teach every summer during my vacation at the University of Maryland College Park, so I'm still an academic. I never uh, felt that I am a career diplomat because I'm not. I'm a political appointee. I came for a mission, and I think my mission is going to be foreclosed very soon. So I'll go back to my natural habitat, which is academia. However, today my address is not going to be within the academic perspective because I can't. I'm wearing the hat of a diplomat. Although I would have loved to be an academic because I could share my ingenious ideas of how to find solutions to this protracted conflict that has been with us for the last hundred years. You know, sometimes when things like conflict management, uh, conflict resolution, uh, models, when I read about these things, you know, immediately it, it comes to me that I have to be a conceptual a person in order to understand how to diagnose this protracted conflict and I call it protracted because it's a conflict between two epistemic communities that have been at loggerheads for the last hundred years and I call it protracted because it does not really confine itself within the parameters of fighting over territories as much as there are additional dimensions to this conflict that make it much more complicated and more complex i.e. the elements of fundamentalism, extremism on both sides that makes it, you know, even uh, very hard to think of plausible solutions with all these extra additions that uh, transforms this conflict from my own historical perception of a secular conflict to a religious conflict. And when the elements of religion become the fulcrum of the conflict, it makes it even worse. And that's why sometimes I get so disappointed, you know, with the developments to the point I become, you know, immediately uh, attracted uh, to, uh, to the idea that uh, uh, of Antonio Gramsci, when he says the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the goodwill. But, as a human being, we have to be hopeful. I cannot continue to be pessimistic and we cannot give up. And being hopeful, meaning that we have to use our strenuous efforts in finding solutions. And solutions are not easy if we don't have the right mindsets to accept the politique réelle, the objective conditions, and the transformation of our self-indulgence in this process. So if you ask me today, do we have a peace process? I say we don't have peace, we don't have a process. We, but Palestinians and Israelis, are stuck today between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. So there is no chance to talk about peace 
when we are totally at loggerheads, polarized in our opinions, and there is not one inch to budge into something that is called at least reconciliation, going back, I mean, to the negotiating table. Because from my experience in second track and first track, we have always been stuck in what we call zero-sum conflict. My gains are your losses, or your losses are my gains. And that in itself is not a starter. So we needed to think of certain models in conflict resolution to break the ice, as we say, and, and, and get to business. At the University of Maryland, I was lucky to work with a bunch of professors over a model that we ended up calling the ARIA model, the musical ARIA. A stands for adversarial, R stands for reflexive, I stands for integrative, and then you have the last A stands for an action plan. And just to explain this model, I think you know this model has been very efficient because we use it with university students across the divide, we used it with professionals, we used it with uh, 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 ex-military officials, ex-PLO combatants, whatever you want to call them. And this model had worked to break the ice and at least to think that the glass is half full rather than half empty. So we managed eventually through an academic process and through such a model to reach that stage. You know, the adversarial part, for example, listen, if you look at our speeches in the United Nations, you know, every speaker tries to defend his position. He doesn't listen to the other die. It ends up to be the dialogue of the deaf. The more you have body language, the more you raise your voice, the more you point fingers, the more you think you are gaining the grounds. This is the adversarial position. So the other side will do exactly the same. What do we end up with? Nothing, <laughs> except more polarization on both sides. Now, when we need to move into the second step, try to separate ourselves and go into this soul searching process. Why did I say what I have said during the, for example, the session of the United Nations? How can I justify what I have said? Do I have legal? arguments? Do I have rational arguments? Do I believe in what I was saying in stereotyping, demonizing, dehumanizing the other side in order to score points? This is what we call the psychological aspect of the conflict, where you have to understand the psyche of your opponent in order to know exactly how to deal with them. This is the most, uh, I would say, excruciating process, you know, where you have to go into defending you know, our position or your position in a way that it makes it real and acceptable to the other side. Once we pass through that stage, then we come to search for common ground. We start looking, you know, what are our priorities in this conflict? What are our needs, our concerns? What are the needs and the concerns of the other? So we start looking for positive cooperation in order to reach a conclusion where it is doable, workable, together you know, in overcoming all the hurdles that have been impediments, you know, in reaching an agreement. Then you come to the action plan where, you know, the, li the sky is the limit in search for coming ground. You can put so many ideas. You have to think like Edward de Bono, who taught us lateral thinking, thinking outside the box. Throw everything, put it in that box, you know. Be intuitive, be creative, be ingenious, you know, in your ideas. Then, as a joint group, you start prioritizing which is more important for both, you know, in terms of finding a... Then you write the action plan. So this model has been very, very, very effective. And I think, you know, as an academic, I have tried it in second track negotiations as well as we tried it in first track. But in first track, it was a dismal failure because of the mindsets of leaders who go there with the maximalist position, they're not willing to compromise, and they don't have optimum negotiations in their thinking or in their psyche. So it's a non-starter. For example, we talk about Jerusalem. I give you one simple example because I don't want, I, I need to tell you about the politics, the current politics. Uh, when you put the question of sovereignty over Jerusalem, 
finish. We pack up and leave. It's a non-starter. Both sides, you know, become too extreme in their positions where there is no compromise. But an icebreaker would be, why not start with the functionality of combining the two? And let's start with the institutional infrastructural development, you know, start from bottom up. Why need to discuss sovereignty, which is the ultimate, in the beginning, where there would be no compromise on this issue? Okay, so the functionality of using such models are very important, but unfortunately, in first track, it did not work because I don't think we have the mindset of leaders to accept the painful concessions. We don't have it. It's still the idea of have it all. Now, when I say we're stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible, I mean it. I mean it. Because since Camp David, we did not have serious negotiations between the two parties. And let's not kid ourselves. Negotiations... Yeah, there were communications through third party, Kerry and others, but we did not sit at a negotiating table and on parity level discussed our problems and negotiated a deal. We did not. We went to Annapolis. That was the last time that there was a physical presentation by Olmert and President Abbas. So after that, we did not have any physical contact, you know, between the two parties. And all negotiations were doomed to failure from the beginning. I'm not going to discuss Oslo because I was against Oslo. And Oslo was a dismal failure. It legitimized Israeli occupation of the West Bank. That was my initial reaction when I read the agreement. And I know Ron Pundak and uh, Hirschfeld. I've done so much work with them. I know exactly how they think. And the final product of the Oslo agreement was a sellout on the part of the Palestinians because it was not really went through the details where we were the victims of certain uh, 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 agreements like the Paris Peace Protocol. It's like giving your neck to the Israelis and hang. Who would accept the collection of tax revenues by your enemy while you are still in the process of negotiating and settling a conflict. How do you do that? Our tax revenues are collected by the Israelis. And when the Israelis don't want to give the tax to the Palestinian Authority, then we don't have almost 130 million shekels or whatever a month that is collected from Palestinians through the crossing of borders. Who would do that? Anyway, there are many pitfalls for the Oslo Agreement, which I'm not going to delve in, but one positive thing that comes out of Oslo is that the element of recognition came into fruition, which means that the Palestinians have recognized the state of Israel and to a certain degree, the Israelis recognize that there are Palestinians living in the occupied territories. But they did not really assume that the nationhood could lead to a statehood for the Palestinians. This is not guaranteed by the Israelis. So this is a protracted conflict that has been shaped along history by two, much, two important factors. There is the factor of fear, mutual fear, and the factor of mutual distrust. And because of these two important factors that have some psychological impact, I think we did not get into what we call the ice-breaking position where we have, in one way or another, uh, could have conducted reasonable and tete-a-tete -tete, you know, negotiations. And all these negotiations were diktat policies. It was the diktat of power politics. It's the top dog Israel, the underdog Palestinians, uh, with a third party supposedly an honest broker of peace, ends up to be unequivocally supporting the top dog over the underdog. And that's why 24 years, with the gavel holders, the peace process being brokered by the United States, 
had led to the dismal failure and to the major conflicts between Palestinians and Israelis. And still we are stuck whether the United States of America can deliver the goods or whether there will be another third party that could be more efficient to break, to have a breakthrough between the two parties. And so far we have seen, you know, uh, a European uh, 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 beset by its domestic policies. We see an Arab world that is totally chaotic. And when we talk about the regional involvement of Arabs, I mean, come on, come on. The Arabs have been a problematic to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. They have not played conducive conditions in order to reach an agreement. And I think this regional approach is a total disaster. I believe, James, I believe personally that the only solution will emanate from the two parties to the conflict. But we need a facilitator to this conflict because any decisions that we take, we have to live with those decisions the day after. No imposed solutions. You have to understand, there will never be imposed solutions. And second, it's a reality. There will never be a military solution to this conflict. So let's cut the crap and get to the point. If we understand that these two are important considerations, then what is impeding us from sitting and going through direct negotiations? Conflict management, my friend, is a total failure. Because this is what the Americans have been doing. Crisis management. Crisis management meaning the perpetuation of conflict. It's not conflict resolution. We're not nipping it from the bud. The Americans have failed. The UK has been totally subservient to that of the United States. And now with Brexit as an excuse, they have nothing to do with the political process. Theresa May is jockeying to have the Saudis and the Gulfists to have trade relations because that will be the alternative in dealing with trades leaving the EU. And I don't want to talk about UK policies because I have so much it will take a long lecture. They are the source of our trouble in the region. And I, I must say, it is such an insult to the Palestinian people to mark or to celebrate the centenary of Balfour. I have been campaigning for the last eight months. I've spoken with the foreign ministers, parliament, speeches and what have you, letters, nothing. They are adamant. No apologies for the Palestinians and no recognition of the Palestinian state. The Balfour Declaration is an important historic document of the colonial power of the United Kingdom. And that's why it's part of our history. We have the right to celebrate it. Because they say that they owed it to the Jews who were persecuted in Europe Yes, sir, at the expense of diasporizing an entire nation and taking over the land. That was the reward. Who is Britain with a piece of letter that signs, gives territory and diasporizes one million people and brings Jewish aliyah from all over the world to come and live in Palestine? No, I don't believe in biblical prophecies, because I don't believe that God is a real estate agent. Okay? That this is the promised land, he gave it to the Jews, and this, we don't want to go into this. And I don't want to go into the previous presentations, going back to Resolution 181 and the Partition Plan. If Israel is not willing to secede the 1967 borders, which is only 22% of historic Palestine, and they are now controlling sea area, which is above 60%, and they are compromising to leave 650,000 settlers living in more than 140 settlements and in creating cantons with non-geographic contiguity whatsoever in the West Bank, sealing East Jerusalem by the E1 envelope, separating Gaza, of course, without a corridor, there is no connection, and yet they talk about a two-state solution. 
So I would like to know what is this two-state solution that we are talking about when there is no geographic contiguity, where there is no economic viability, where there is no political viability for a government that is representing almost 5 million Palestinians that you call the authority. Now we have to understand that the authority is not the right address for negotiations with Israel. Because the authority is the outcome of the Oslo Agreement. It's the outcome of what the PLO has signed with the State of Israel. So we don't look at the authority as someone who is in charge, or which is in charge of the population, in terms of representing them politically. The authority is only managing the civilian lives of the Palestinian people. But it happens that our President Abu Mazen is the chief executive of the PLO, and at the same time, he is the president of the Palestinian National Authority, which is a weird combination I cannot understand. So people make a lot of mistakes when they say that the authority, the authority, the authority. I don't represent the authority here. I represent the PLO. And I am assigned by President Abbas as the chief executive of the PLO. So even if Hamas sits here, he would love to hear me speaking because I speak on his behalf as well as I speak on behalf of the other factions. There is no room for partisanship in this conflict. Hamas also has to understand that there are certain requirements. To be part and parcel of this political fabric, they have to understand that military solution is no solution. The recognition of Israel, we have already recognized Israel. And if they want to be part of the political process, they have to recognize Israel. Alhamdulillah. They just last week came up with a revision of their national charter. Now, they started to realize that the politic rail dictates upon them to recognize that the only solution is the 1967 borders. Ahlan wa sahlan. Now they started to think pragmatically, which is choosing between constraints. This is the situation as far as the musalaha is concerned. And now we are hopeful, as always we are hopeful, when we reach to touch the tip of the iceberg, something happens and nothing goes, everything goes wrong. The anticipation that maybe in three weeks time, or a month time, we will have a national unity government. And everybody says, you know, how could you approach the negotiations when you are divided and this and that? My question goes to the other side. Are the settlers willing to negotiate? Are the settlers willing to leave the West Bank, which they think this is a God-given territory? So there are opposition and extremists on the other side. Why do you keep on blaming our side that we are divided and we cannot, you know, be ready to go and negotiate peace? But who initiated this whole peace process? It was the PLO. Hamas was never part of the PLO. Why should Hamas be an integral part of the negotiations? Hamas is a faction, part of our social fabric. Ahlan wa sahlan. If they accept the deal, let's have the deal. If they don't, it's their, it's their choice. And nobody is, you know, when I hear criticism about, oh, oh, no elections, no elections. No, we want elections. Israel is prohibiting us from elections. How can we have elections when we can't have access to Gaza? How can we have elections when we don't have access to East Jerusalem? You talk about elections, we're ready to elect. We are more democratic than the state of Israel. And we proved it. We proved it in two general elections. And President Abbas won 55%. He did not win like other Arab presidents, 99.999. So this is democracy. We believe that we cannot be a theocratic state. We believe we cannot be succumbing to fundamentalism. We believe that the only plausible solution is a secular democratic state. Now. When we go back to all these models historically, let me just remind you that the PLO has transformed its politics. And Rose, Professor Rosemary Hollis knows our history meticulously. When we have transformed from total liberation to almost pragmatism in accepting the state of Israel, 
over 78% of Palestine, I think we have made our painful historic concession. But we need Israel to make its historic painful concession. And I hate these two words when it comes to Israel. We don't see the other side is willing. I don't believe that Israel is ready to make peace. And the question of security is an obsession in Israel. It's this siege mentality that is still reigning supreme in the psyche of all Israelis. And that's why today, Daesh and others have even played an imperative role in creating that stigmatized perception that Palestinians and Arabs are terrorists. And that's why people like Netanyahu could really, you know, capitalize in creating and instilling fear in the Israeli population that the real danger is not the tamed Palestinians who are under our wings. No, it's Iran, it's Hezbollah, it's Daesh. You know, it's the melange of the Shiites and the Sunnites for different reasons are ready to come and obliterate the state of Israel. Sometimes, you know, I fail to define what is security. I believe we, the Palestinians, we want security from the Israelis. And I assure you, if you have ever had an independent Palestinian state, I will be the one to say, let's have all the posts of surveillance in the Jordan Valley by the IDF. Because I want the IDF to protect me as a Palestinian from those infidels, as we call them, Daesh, Qaeda, and what have you. And when we talk about a demilitarized state, we mean it, James. We mean demilitarized state. We have studied the cases of South Tyrol. We have studied the cases of uh, uh, Costa Rica. And we do understand exactly what a demilitarized state is all about. Yes, we need to build strong institutions, infrastructural development. And that is the power of our state is our human resources opening to the Arab world. And believe me, Israel cannot continue in building high walls. And high walls are not good fences because they're not prompting to be good neighbors. Eventually, those high walls are going to come down. And that's why I'm very keen to read the paper of Professor Rapoport when he says homeland, a one homeland and two states. Now, there are ideal situations and there are practical situations. I don't see the partition plan as an ideal situation. I see it as an ideal, sorry. I don't see it as practical. I see still the two-state solution doable. But if Israel continues with the current, you know, policies, I think then the two-state so the two-state solution now on the ground, if you go and see yourself, it's undoable. I mean, there is no way we could have a two-state solution with the current infrastructure of Israeli occupation. We can't. But if you want to ask me whether it's doable, it is doable. That two meter slab concrete is just, you know, with four what you call bolts on the ground could be unscrewed. And we could use that slab in building, you know, homes for the refugees. It's not going to go for, uh, for free. We'll pay for it. It is doable if Israel wants to. And that's why, because Israel is insisting on the status quo plus, and this is their interpretation of one state solution, is that they want Israel plus the occupied territories to be administered, you know, like uh, uh, what you call autonomy, and keep, to the, keep the settlements and keep Area C under control and tell the Palestinians, you want to call this a state? Fine. If not, go to the Emirate of Gaza, you know, and call that Emirate your state. But we are not going to allow you free access of border crossings and what have you. So this is what Israel wants. Netanyahu is just buying time and he is trying to complicate things by creating new facts on the ground which he thinks that will be irreversible if you go back to the negotiating table. This is what he is doing. He is wrecking. He is the biggest spoiler of the peace process. I believe, and tell me when I have to finish, please. I believe that any regional 
regional approach is a failure. Because I don't believe in the democracy of these Arab regimes. And I think, you know, if we think that we had uh, different state structures as a result of this, what I call the chaos in the Arab world, I think we are just fooling ourselves. Look what happened in Egypt. Who's back? I mean, Sisi, who's, Sisi is like what? You want to compare him to Barak? I mean, I don't see dramatic changes in the Arab world. And I will never see any dramatic changes if there is no rule of law, if there is no true democracy, if there is no civil society, if there is no freedom of expression. I cannot see a resurrected Arab world. And I wouldn't put my eggs in their basket, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we are sometimes praised to power politics. We are sometimes you know, doomed to accept certain things because of financial restraints. But ironically, ironically, our major supporter financially is the EU. And even more ironically comes the Americans. It's not the Arab world. If you think the Arab world, you're uh, just uh, fooling yourselves. It's not the Arab world. How many times we had conferences where billions have been pledged, okay, to rebuild Gaza and Jerusalem? Show me one single penny had come to the Palestinian either authority or straightforward to the NGOs. We haven't seen any penny. It's all pledges. Who controls the finances and the transfers? Do you think, you know, the Saudi prince can just issue a check and send it over to Gaza? It has to go through a filtration process. Americans will stop it, you know, Israel will stop it. So let's not think that regional approach is an approach. No. I think still I believe that Palestinians and Israelis should be convinced that they are the ones who will sort out this problem. If there is the intention of peace, believe me, even the issue of Jerusalem is negotiable. That's my deep belief for the last 25 years since I have been engaged in all these tr second track negotiations. And believe me, this is not the first time we sit with Israelis. I just came back less than a week from Cyprus. And we had a second track on security, Palestinians and Israelis. And we sat down and outlined every single detail, what will be the security arrangements when we recognize our borders. So the idea here starts with one simple question, and I have so much to share with you, but I don't have time. I would ask, and I wish our ambassador of Israel was here, just to ask him, if you want to negotiate peace, one simple question. If you tell me where your borders are, I'm willing to negotiate peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, we have about, well, just under 20 minutes for a question and answer or discussion session. I'm sure that there are many issues that uh, audience members would want to raise after that rousing speech. So um, perhaps I can take three questions to begin with and, and then we can do a, a first round. Yes, Rosemary. Dr. Professor, um, I was very recently in Jerusalem and the last day I was there, I read Haaretz, uh, Haaretz. in English as one does. Yeah. And I noticed that the coverage of the trip to um, Abbas's trip to Washington and meeting with Donald Trump, um, I thought it was actually quite amusing that it was written as a news story and basically said the Palestinian strategy with Donald Trump is to flatter him without shame, to tell him he's the father we never had. <laughs> he's, uh, he's the only person who could do the deal and so on. And so Haaretz was trying to second guess what on earth are the Palestinians up to, uh, lying shamelessly to Donald Trump as if he's going to sort things for them. Uh, now they came up with the theory 
that um, this would embarrass Netanyahu because when it turned out that the conflict could not be resolved as easily as Trump now seems to think it can be, it will be Netanyahu who brings the bad news and reigns on his parade. Yeah. So um, can you offer a better um, insight onto what the Palestinian strategy is with Donald Trump? Uh, yeah. Should we take another couple of questions? Okay. Yes. In light of Hamas's new charter, how do you see relations between PA slash PLO um, and Hamas? Manuel. Yeah. Yes. Um, just on the talks at the moment and uh, lots of discussion about whether Trump is going to try and convene a three way meeting in Netanyahu about himself. It's interesting at the moment that it doesn't seem like the Palestinian Authority has imposed any preconditions to such a meeting, whereas before there were very strong preconditions, settlement frees, uh, 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 releasing prisoners, um, mm. yeah. uh, you know, committing to 967 lines. Are there going to be no preconditions to such a meeting, or are they going to emerge? I just need to know your thoughts on that. Mm. Let's take those three questions, and yes. we'll do another round. <coughs> well... Uh, Sometimes it's so hard to speak my mind, you know. I was asked by Tobias Elwood in the Council of Arab Ambassadors, what are your expectations, Mr. Ambassador, from President Abbas's trip and meeting with Donald Trump? He was shocked to what I have told him. I said, it is a lip service. Nothing is going to come out of this meeting. Although my president and his entourage are going with high, high expectations, and I'm afraid that the frustrations are going to be higher. That was my answer. And the reason why I'm saying this is that we cannot see, you know, uh, everybody is gambling on Trump that he could make the best deal. If he is, you know, a businessman, a businessman could win, could profit, and could lose. And I can see the loss for the Palestinians with this deal. I wouldn't really put all my eggs in Trump and saying that he is going to break the deal between both of us. But as Palestinians who are the weaker side of this equation, what other choices that we have? With the limitations of our choices, no arms struggle, no structural violence, no this, no that, you know, security collaboration. What other things that could impact Israel to give concessions? So I believe that the Americans may try, and this connects me to the answer to James, is that for the first time, I think, the Palestinians won't put any preconditions because Trump is not going to allow that. And Trump will tell them, this is the deal. Whether you like it or not, you have to show up. If you don't show up, I'm not going to give another chance. And let's not forget that Trump is more involved with his local politics, with local issues, with global issues, with the Middle East. He is not totally going to exert all his efforts into the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Because he has seen the history of all the negotiations and all the administrations that were involved and did not really break any kind of, it's not going to be the exception. But he might put some very practical ideas where both Palestinians and Israelis have to accept the bitter realities. Now to what extent Palestinians and Israel are going to accept those bitter realities. This is something yet to be foreseen. But I wouldn't, you know, uh, think that, you know, within the coming few months we will have a peace deal. The issues are much more complicated than that. And let's not forget that when we went to Oslo, we did not have any kind of uh, uh, support coming from the population on both sides. You know, both parties went to Oslo. It's a back channel. And then even when we went to Washington, there was no complete backing to the entire negotiating process on both sides.
So we cannot just anticipate that a deal could be imposed on the Palestinian people and the same is true for the Israelis. Now, as, as far as Hamas and the PLO is concerned, I think, you know, it's, it's the question lies in the fact that I cannot see any kind of reconciliation between two ideologies that are at loggerhead. Hamas is a fundamentalist group with an ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, my friend. That's their ideology. Uh, 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 getting rid of occupation is the stepping stone towards the building of an Islamic State. Okay? So, they are willing to coordinate with PLO and what have you in the first stage to get rid of occupation. But later, the idea is, how can you reconcile a national project of Fatah with that of a theocratic state of Hamas? It's, it's I mean, total loggerheads. I mean, it's, it's, it's what I call the paradox. It couldn't, it will never work out, my friend. Now, these national unity governments and what have you, these are only what I call, you know, stepping stones towards the realization of both objectives that are in total contradiction. It's an oxymoron situation, actually. So I, I wouldn't see that kind of a reconciliation, unlike South Africa when we talk about, you know, apartheid and then, you know, the reconciliation and, and healing and this. This is not going to happen between Hamas and the PLO, unfortunately. And uh, 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 Hamas, I don't think it's willing to go into the process of power sharing in Gaza. This is a, a golden opportunity to control Gaza and they're not going to give it up easily, as you know, because, you know, the stakes are too high for Hamas to, to give in. But Hamas is becoming too pragmatic because, as you can see, Today, with the regional developments, Iran's position is completely different when it comes to helping Hamas. Hezbollah is, of course, surrogate of Iran, let alone Bashar al-Assad of Syria, you know, detests Hamas because of their position, you know, during the civil war. So these three parties that were giving political, military and financial support are no more there for Hamas, let alone that Hamas has difficult situation with Sisi because of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt. So they are in a very difficult position. They are totally isolated. They lack of funds and they don't want to be totally peripheralized in any future deal. They had to do what they had to do. But you look at the structure, basically, of the leadership. It's like Alibaba and the 40 thieves. The same leadership, but they just changed their roles. All right? And the only thing that, you know, attracted the entire West is the fact that now they believe that they accept, sorry, in the 1967 borders. But this is yet a test for us to know how far they can go with that commitment. Shall we take another round of questions, please? Yes, Lord Tanzra. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Sassian. I very much enjoyed your presentation. If you were a candidate for the presidency, um, and I had a vote, I'd vote for you. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's on my at the moment. I, I just wanted to know uh, about Hamas's position and likely success in any elections in the West Bank, mm. because they are beginning to be much more popular there. And the second bit of the question is, what is the position of Mr. Barghouti? Mm. Uh, I mean, this may not be something you're willing to talk about. No, no, I'm willing to talk about. Mr. Barghouti is a good friend of mine. And this Mr. Barghouti, you know, together in the 90s, we have participated in at least 10 second track negotiations. Mr. Barghouti came out of the prison advocating the two-state solution and advocating peace as the only way out of this conflict. True. Now, with the... Uh, are we taking? Can, I can answer him. Finish. Okay, well, okay. And and concerning concerning uh, 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 Marwan, uh, you know there is a hunger strike yeah. now, and it's getting really serious now. It's getting serious, and it's a shame that the international is not moving unless they see people dying, and I'm sure that people are going to die, and this thing is going really to fathom a lot of reaction against Israel. So I must say that the Israelis.
should at least respond to some of those basic demands of political prisoners. Now, I put this aside. But Marwan Barghouti is a national leader. He is a leader. And he is referred to by the West as the Mandela. So he is an interesting personality that could be a street leader. But I doubt his potentials as a statesman. And this is where, personally, I have my doubts. But if, if uh, but, uh, Marwan, if he gets out of the prison, and if the Israelis get him out of the prison, I think two things will move forward. The reconciliation between Hamas and the PLO would move forward. And second, the ice break in the total stalemate in the peace process could be moved by Marwan. That's my reading to the situation. And as far as uh, uh, Hamas, uh, your question was... Uh, in, the West Bank. in the West Bank. Now, I totally agree with you. If today we hold elections in Gaza and the West Bank, in Gaza, Hamas would lose totally. Because, you know, the people, almost 1.8, 1.9 million people have lived under Hamas. You're talking about almost 11 years. So they are disenchanted, they are frustrated. Hamas brought two wars, total destruction. Look the way they are living. It's a one open air concentration camp. So people will vote for Fatah. Unfortunately, we don't have a third way. Either this or that. In the West Bank, I agree with you. Because of the failures in halting settlement activities, the failures in providing security to the Palestinians through the total collaboration with the security forces in Israel, the dire economic conditions, and the checkpoints, all these are recipes for disaster. Of course, people are not going to vote for the uh, Palestinian Authority or Fatah, as a matter of fact, because they see that they have not achieved anything for the last 24 years under what we call the peace process. So I might agree with your analysis that Hamas might have an edge over Fatah in the West Bank. And this will complicate the issues much further. And when I say that Israel does not want this election because they know that Hamas will come to the fore and that their life will be more miserable. We have time for one more question. Uh -huh. Is there another question? Yes. Um, the polling that you see of when it comes to sort of conversations about peace and focus on Israel and Palestinian sort of, uh, communities uh, sort of goes against the belief that perhaps young people are more liberal and old people are more hawkish, and that you see that young people are less, more pessimistic and perhaps even less interested in peace than, than old people who have a memory of peace processes. Does that mean that there's, that there's sort of a closing window, or is there a way that we can regain confidence for people who are younger in the region? Uh, I tell you what, our hope is in our youth, on both sides. It is unfortunate that our youth are becoming hawkish because of the current situation. When the youth see settlement activities, no prospects for job opportunities. I mean, let's not forget that this, this conflict is not only about politics. It's economics, my friend. The piston of the first intifada were the economic issues that we face as Palestinians. And Professor Rosemary Hollis, we have seen her and we have heard her during the first intifada in Jerusalem. And she can attest to the fact that the economic factor was the piston for the intifada. After 20 years of occupation, our economic situation was desperate in dire economic conditions, no job opportunities, paying taxes to the Israelis, nothing, no services in return people started more or less getting sick and worried that there will never be a solution to their conflict. They want an end to occupation. Yes, yes. And that means freedom, freedom of movement, and it means personal security. They are more afraid of house break-ins, they're more afraid of getting arrested for no particular reason, or their children getting arrested for no particular reason. Absolutely, I agree with you, true. yes. So to say it's all economic, I'm not saying all economic. I said the economics is the piston. Piston. But it's dead but, life. Yeah, yeah. Dead but dead the, dead political dead issues, the political issues are there. All I'm saying, 
the economic situation exacerbates even further the political frustration. This is what I'm saying. So we cannot just eliminate the issue of economics. Now, a lot of people, you know, resort to violence. Why? Because, because only because they don't have a state or because of their wretched situation, the humiliation, the incarceration without due process of law, the uh, no job opportunities. All these factors put together makes people desperate. And desperation leads to action of violence. So we cannot just take the economics out. No, the economics is an important fact, but it is not the factor. And I agree with you, the end of occupation and having a state is the only feasible solution. So with all respect to what you're discussing here as models, it could be a good intellectual exercise. But we need you to be practitioners at the end of the day. What is doable, what is not doable? If you ask me, I will tell you, oh, one state solution. It's ideal for me, a democratic secular state. No Jewish state, a democratic secular, one man, one vote. That's ideal. That's my dream. But is that dream going to become a reality? When I have six million Jews, or Israelis, sorry, seven million of them, who categorically, even the extreme liberal, are afraid of the demographic bomb, which is, you know, the Palestinian population growth. That this will lead to a disaster, and that messianic dream of political Zionism in the creation of the state of Israel, or the concept of a Jewish state, and you know that there is a law now passing in the Knesset. What does that mean? This is a pure racist law against two million Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship. And then, to come and talk about a one-state solution? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a dream, my friend. It's a dream. It's not going to happen. Neither the United States nor the international community. The only thing that the international community has accepted, even the parties to the conflict have accepted, is the two-state solution, all right, with certain uh, land swapping. That has been accepted. I mean, we almost, you know, got it in Camp David. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. But the settlement activities are becoming an impediment towards the realization of a two-state solution. So if we want to have a deal, we should have a deal now with no preconditions on both sides. Go to the room until the white smoke comes, then we have a pope. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think we have to draw it to a close now. Uh, we're going to break for lunch for an hour and we'll be back here um, in, uh, at 1.15 to resume with uh, our second panel. But before then, please thank me. Uh, please join me in thanking thank you. Uh, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you.